Hurry along, please. Non stop to Victoria. Hurry along. Close them doors, please. Close them doors. Right. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Is this the London train? Yeah, of course it is. Non stop Victoria. Leaving right now. Oh, wait, please. Oh, dear. I'll read it up then. You've got, you got half a second. First door you come to, up in. Oh. Can't expect the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway to wait all night for one person, you know. Oh, I, I, I'm so sorry. I had such trouble in getting here. Ah, well, you're here now. And you'll still be here half an hour from now, waiting for another train if you don't hop it right smartly. I'm going to blow me whistle right now and that's it. I, I, I'm sorry. Thank you. I, I won't be a moment. Better not be, miss. Right, George! <laughs> Forgive me of bursting in like that on you. If you hadn't, in all likelihood, you'd have missed the train. I, I hope you don't mind. Not at all. Do sit down. The train's starting to sway already. You can't be comfortable standing there like that. Thank you. Oh, what's that? Paper pasted on the window just by my seat. This Apartment reserved from Brighton to Victoria. Train 908 non stop. And the date, today's date. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh, sir, th this compartment is reserved for you. Uh, yes. Yes, it is. Oh, and I, and I burst in upon your privacy, and after you've paid extra for it and everything... Oh, please, please, you mustn't think of it. It's no aggravation for me. Uh, I would change to another seat in another compartment at the next station, only... The next see... station will be Victoria, the end of the line. This is, after all, a non-stop train. Yes, you're right. Therefore, we must make the best of the situation, mustn't we? However, I, I repeat, I'm in no way put out by your, uh... Uh, intrusion? On the contrary, I rather welcome it. I, I really don't want to interrupt you or, or interfere or anything like that. But I assure you, you don't and won't. There's no reason at all why we can't pass a pleasant hour together now that we're here, as it were, uh, compelled to each other's company, is there? Well, no. We can talk or be silent or anything you like. I'm not much of a conversationalist, I'm afraid. Splendid! I've enough chatter and anecdote for the pair of us. I'm an unquenchable enthusiast and egotist. It shall be my pleasure to entertain you, then. To cater to your whim and your wish. To fill your mind with visions of wine and peacocks, gold moidores, and the afternoon wind that churns dust devils upon the arid faces of eastern deserts. Is the thought not stimulating? <sighs> it's settled, then. It's settled, it's settled. The hour shall pass like the wind, even as our famous train rushes through the night. She goes well, too. Look here, through my window. We've already passed Preston Park Station. And there are the village lights of Patcham winking down there below the rails. Whoops! <laughs> Suddenly they're blotted out. Well, what's that? A greater darkness. A greater roar from the iron wheels, beating back from wet brick walls. Do you know this line well? Not too well. I've travelled back and forth from London to Brighton on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> I know every inch of it, my dear. Every inch. I must have travelled this line a hundred times. Perhaps a thousand. Yes. <laughs> that must have been very, very pleasant for you. Every sleeper. Every wheel click in the rail joints. Every rumble of crossover points, every station with its flare of lemon gaslight racing past in the bright darkness. <laughs> I always travel on the non-stop at night. The sound and the motion excite me, thrill me. I love to see the rush through the length of a station, the blur of hunched, disappointed faces huddled into chilled, coated shoulders, facing the interminable wait until the signals turn green once more. And the humble, apologetic stopping train shoves in, shame-faced picks them up. <laughs> While I rush triumphant through the dark, it's exhilarating. Must be. You have a liking for speed? I have a liking for many things. Speed is but one of them. Uh, but I confess I do enjoy this 50-mile stretch of the railway. And I know it intimately, right down to its most humble fish plate. Yes. Ah, there you are, you see. 
You must be a perfectionist, sir. <laughs> I don't even know what a fish plate is. And every nut, every bolt, every ballast stone upon this right of way all have their history. Did you know that? I'm sure they do have, but <laughs> I didn't know it. Did you know that even now we're rapidly approaching a place of great history and tragedy upon the London, Brighton and South Coast permanent way? Did you? Did you hear that rattle of the wheels just now? Feel the whole train sway slightly? I did notice something. Why? Those were the crossover points one mile south of the Clayton Tunnel. Those points were the key to the greatest tragedy this railway company has ever known. What happened? There. There, did you see that flicker of light going by out there in the darkness? Yes. Well, that's where it all began. There, in the signal box, lost in the chalk gloom down here in the great pike and cutting. That's where. Where or what began? What are you speaking of? Thirteen years ago it was. The winter of 1887. One of those cold, wet, miserable nights. When the southwest gales beating up the channel drive the rain in sheets across the downs. And down there, alone in that signal box, warmed by his coke stove, surfeited with strong tea and kippers from his old blackened frying pan, lulled into drowsiness by the mesmeric beat of the rain upon the slate roof. One man. Just one man. What happened to him? Was he murdered? <laughs> murdered? He? <laughs> now, why of all things would you ask me that? No, no. Now, nothing happened to him. Nothing at all. Then what is the point of all this. Picture it. Picture it in your mind if you can. Fifteen minutes before, a locomotive coming up from Brighton had been sent onto the down line from London. He had performed this deed upon receipt of orders from Brighton over the telegraph. The worthy signalman did as he was bidden and returned to his skipper. The locomotive steamed through the tunnel and into hassocks a few minutes later, where it was shunted immediately off the down line and into the siding, where it went peacefully about the task of putting together its little local goods train. What is the point of all this? What are you trying to tell me? <laughs> My dear, a story worth telling is worth telling well, is it not? And I have a great head for details. I should like you to hear them all. Do I have your attention? Yes. <laughs> I'm so glad. Our worthy signalman, picture him under the gaslight, engrossed with a kipper and an enamel mug of tea. And in the dimness, at one end of his signal oh, box... Oh, stop it, stop! But why, dear? Why? You're going to tell me something awful, I know it. Something terrible was going to happen. <laughs> no, my dear. The terrible thing had already happened. What do you mean? There, in the dimness, beyond his immediate range of vision, the great steel lever with which the signalman had opened the points so that the locomotive could change onto the down line for its brief journey, lay open where the man had left it. He forgot about it entirely. What happened? Hard upon the heels of the locomotive came a night goods train to London Bridge. It rattled by the signal box, came to the points, and was shunted onto the down line. There was, even at that moment, rushing through hassocks towards Brighton, a late express from Victoria, a non-stop running upon the down line. Oh. Suddenly, for some reason he never subsequently explained, the signalman rushed to the lever, saw the position it was in, and stood in helpless horror, glaring up the line through the tearing night rain. He stood poised upon toes in horror and heard the awful tearing smash a mile and a half away as the two trains met head on in the cold, sooty darkness. Oh, how awful. It's unbelievable. But true. Oh, there were very few survivors of the Clayton Tunnel disaster. A few badly shaken passengers and the guards from the rear of both trains. I see what you meant earlier about the line having a history. But such tragedy. 
Well, at least, touch wood, there shall be no recurrence of it this night on this train. Oh, I hope not. Rest assured, in the relating of the story, we've long since passed through Clayton Tunnel. <laughs> the train is going famously, is it not? Very fast, yes. And was I not right? The time, too, with stimulating conversation, rushes past as if upon gilded wings. Your description seems a little elaborate, but true. There was an interesting sequel to the Clayton Tunnel disaster that moved it, for myself at least, into the realm of bizarre coincidence. Really? What was it? Quite unwittingly, I became tied, connected, as it were, to the circumstances of the collision. How extraordinary. Would it be polite to inquire? Of course it would. I hoped you'd ask me that. <laughs> it's far more than polite. It's most acceptable that you should ask. I'm, I'm so glad. <laughs> I was a lad, just 15 at the time of the accident, living happily with my parents upon our estate in Hampshire. And when the accident occurred, there was among the passengers on the down train a man by the name of Burgess Felsham. You know, there's something quite familiar about that name. What could it be? I think in a few moments, if you'll give me time to complete my story, you'll recognize the name more readily. Oh, please go on. <laughs> Thank you, I shall. Felsham was nearing the end of a fairly lengthy train journey that had brought him from Lincolnshire across London and was carrying him to Brighton. Within eight miles of the completion of his rail journey from the eastern counties, Burgess Felsham was killed instantly when the two trains collided in Clayton Tunnel. Oh, poor man. How, how horrible for him. <laughs> yes. Yes, not a few people were saddened and put out by Felsham's untimely demise. Not the least of whom were those who waited for him upon the arrivals platform at Brighton. His family, his friends. Oh, yes, I can imagine how ghastly they must have felt about it. Actually, no. Among his family and his considerable circle of friends, there was a feeling almost akin to relief when the news emerged. Whatever do you mean? How can you say that? Are the people waiting for Burgess Felsham at Brighton Station were considerably shocked and put out by the news. Although, uh, Felsham, in truth, could count no friend nor relative among them. Why? Who, who were they? The Brighton police, my dear. A particularly large detachment. The police? <laughs> Whatever for? <laughs> they were waiting for good old Burgess, you see. <laughs> waiting to take him in charge, arrest him. <laughs> Stick him in the nick is the expression used, I believe. What had he done? Uh, nothing small, my dear. No. Not by any means. <laughs> Nothing less than murder. Murder? And not on a small scale either. Several of them. Many of them, in fact. <sighs> oh, yes. The police were keen to get hold of Felsham. They'd been on his tail for some time. Oh, Burgess knew it, too. That's why he was leaving the country so hastily. <laughs> yes. Ah, uh, Burgess Felsham had been slipshod. Very naughty in his ways. And really, he deserved to be caught. The last laugh was his. By the strange series of events that led up to the Clayton Tunnel disaster, he slipped out of the net once and for all. Rather drastically, perhaps, but certainly beyond redemption. Better for him, really. Better, I should imagine, to suffer one's demise thus, rather than kicking at the end of a length of stout English hemp. But it's horrible. What kind of murders did he do? Young girls. He used to strangle them. <laughs> That's all. That's all? <laughs> what can one say, really? Burgess Felsham was mad. Complete and incurable maniac. His madness drove him to murder. But, but he should have been detained in an asylum, being No, oh, he, he was, yes, several times in appropriate institutions. <laughs> But in due course, he was always released, apparently cured. Once free, it was never long before he returned to his old ways. How can you treat it so lightly? The whole affair is horrible, to say nothing of pitiable. And yet to hear you speak of it, it sounds as if you're amused by it. <laughs> I must admit, I always admired old Burgess, dotty as he was. 
He was a decent old stick when he wasn't off about his funny ways. And he was always most kind to me. So when he dodged the police so well, and so finally, I confess I did find it rather amusing. Come to think of it, I still do. You knew this man? Oh, yes. Very well. How well did you know him? Best possible circumstances. Burgess Falsham was my cousin. As a matter of fact, of all the members of our family alive today, he and I could be said to be the most alike in every way. What are you saying? <laughs> I always admired the old boy. As a child, unconsciously, I used to imitate him in every way possible. And since shortly after his death, you might say I've more or less taken up where he left off. Who oh, is? Yes. And done very well at it, too. Well, I've been copped a few times, of course. But a little treatment at a very good private sanatorium in Brighton has always seemed to set matters right. As a matter of fact, I'm in the process right now of returning from one of these remedial periods. You mean you... you killed people? Oh, yes. Several. That's why I was so pleased when you got in here tonight. Oh, surely, surely you don't mean to kill me. That was Balcom we just passed through. Twenty minutes from Brighton. I say, this is a good train, isn't it? Running right on the nose. <laughs> Another forty minutes to Victoria. Splendid. What did you just ask me, my dear? I asked you if you mean to... Kill me. <laughs> I must admit the idea has been passing back and forth through my mind. And with each pass, it grows more attractive in prospect. Yes, my dear, I think I shall. <sighs> Somewhere between here and Victoria, I think, if you don't mind. I shall strangle you. Mrs. X and Mrs. Y are the women in this case. Mrs. X, you are alleged to clean your sink and no more. Well, I... I Do you kill germs? I, I'm not sure. Is your sink hygienically clean? Well, maybe it is. I... Precisely. Mrs. Y, you use Vim 99? Yes, I do. You get your sink sparkling clean and kill 99% of household germs? That's correct. You see, only Vim 99 contains powerful germ-killing microbands. So Vim 99 gets your sink, pots and pans, bath and stove hygienically clean. 99% germ-free? Correct. Ladies of the jury, what is your verdict? By Vim 99. What is a mother? A mother is a friend, a comforter and a tucker in of shirt tails. She's the one who makes the meals, downs the socks, and tells the bedtime story. When it comes to looking after her family, that's when a mother's care really shows. When she chooses New Radeon with Sunflex, because she knows New Radeon has the miracle of Sunflex to keep on whitening to the end of the wash. It makes the care a mother takes worthwhile. New Radeon with Sunflex washes whiter, and it shows. Who are you? I'm also a Felsham. Graham Felsham. Possibly you wouldn't know of me under that particular name. Felsham, I, I do know that name, I do. I'm sure you do. You're only joking with me, aren't you? Nothing more? It's just a horrible joke. You wouldn't really kill me. You know, my dear, as I look at you now, I almost 
just wish that I was joking with you. It really does seem a shame, doesn't it? Then why do it? Because I must. But why? Why? Well, you see, it's just something that happens to me. I'm quite dotty, you know. <laughs> it's been acknowledged by some of the best men in that field in the land. <laughs> it's what you call a compulsion of sorts. Yes, that's it. I, I have a compulsion to kill. And, and really, I can't control oh, it. But you could. You can. I, I've been watching you, listening to you. You have very good control of yourself. Actually, it may seem that way. But under this apparently calm exterior, I positively see. It's your neck. You see. My neck? Yes, that's it, your neck. It's unfortunate. If you were some revolting wizened harridan, or one of those pale, gross young creatures that one sees so sickeningly often, it would be easy to spurn you with the contempt that you would deserve. Notwithstanding my slightly irregular background, I'm a very particular man. You must understand that. It's important. I I can't understand you. Oh, this is awful. It, it must be a dream. I'm afraid not. Uh, Let me tell you about your neck. <laughs> Have you no idea what it's like? How glorious it is. Can you not imagine the attraction? The fatal attraction it would have for a man like you? No. No, I can't. Oh, stop it. I beg you, please. Please. You stop. hold your head proudly. This is cruel. It is. Oh, God, you stop. Unfortunately, no. That's the one thing I can't do. Oh, but please, please, let me tell you about your neck. So sad, really, that there's been no chance for an evaluation of its exquisite beauty until now, when it's almost too late. Or perhaps there has been a previous evaluation of it. There's been none before. Ever. Splendid, my dear. Splendid. It is fitting under the circumstances that it should fall to me, then, to be the one to do the job. <laughs> oh, I say, that was thoughtless of me. What an insensitive thing to say. Do the job, indeed. Oh, how you must feel the blow of that. <laughs> Just now, suddenly, I see that you're insane. Either insane or a very good actor. Extraordinary actor. Somehow, the latter is too much to expect. <laughs> Hope should spring eternal, I am told. No. Suddenly, I have this feeling that you're not joking about this. There's the strangest feeling moving in me. What is that? One almost of disassociation. As if really I'm not here. And it doesn't matter very much. You feel that, eh? Hmm, it's bizarre. It would not have occurred to me that a mind so attacked could have responded in such a manner. You're depressed, my dear. That's it. Depressed by the prospect. Yes, I suppose I am. Can you blame me? <laughs> a very fair question, to which I can only answer, not really. You're facing a violent death in a matter of minutes, or even of seconds from now, depending upon my whim and choosing. Yet you react in this, this strange manner. How have the others reacted? Oh, in a variety of ways, but yours is the least expected and the most bizarre behavior of all. I wonder if your mood will endure until the ultimate moment. We'll have to see, won't we? You describe the others. There have been many. Very many. But <laughs> not yet, it seems, enough. You are depressed, aren't you? <laughs> Perhaps it would cheer you up if I went on talking about your lovely neck. After all, a woman and her vanity. Is it not true? Go on with your cruelty. You must. But it's not cruelty. Indeed, no. I mean genuinely what I say about your beauty. And in particular that of your neck. It's white, calumnia, and graceful, simple, proud, rather long. Don't do that! <gasps> what? 
I saw the way you looked. The way you looked at the alarm cord. You were going to spring at it, weren't you? You were going to pull it. Stop the train. Try to evade the fate I've chosen for you in that way. I wasn't. I, I, I don't lie to me. Uh, You're going to give the alarm. <laughs> but it wouldn't help you. Not at all. If I stopped the train, you wouldn't dare to touch me. <laughs> you think not, my dear? Then you're an imbecile, do you hear me? <laughs> if you pull that alarm cord, <laughs> you'd be doing me a service. Can't you see that? <laughs> How can you believe that? Have you considered the speed at which our train is rushing through the night? Look, look already, we're past Hawley. We're close to Red Hill. There are only the tunnels through the North Downs to be passed, and we'll be on the very threshold of London. Now, have you taken into account, in view of the speed, just how long it will take to actually stop the train if you pull that cord? No, but... Even with the finest brakes in the world, it takes time to stop hundreds of tons of steel and wood like this. Quite enough time for me to administer the coup de grace to you and to escape into the night once the train has come to a halt. What would be the point of your escape? You would soon be captured. Perhaps. Perhaps not. Although we're close to London, we're not far from the coast. My chances of escape to France would be very good with the element of time and surprise on my side. Your cousin thought that as well, you tell me. But they were waiting for him at Brighton. Still he escaped. He died. He escaped, I tell you! He eluded them! Anyway, my dear, do you think I fear death? I, who have dealt in death so long? I wonder if you think in that way when they take you out into the prison yard to hang you. They do hang for the crime of murder in England, you know. I am well aware of it. But they won't hang me. I'm a certified lunatic. You told me that Burgess Selsham was mad too. You also told me that the law was prepared to hang him for his crimes. It was distinctly possible in poor old Burgess's case. Yes. Yeah. In mine, I'd be inclined to disagree. If anything, to the contrary. How can you be so sure? It's not difficult to foretell. Burgess was only a cousin from a branch of the family lacking influence in the land. My case is a different one. I am the scion of one of England's most prominent families. And that makes a considerable difference. You've committed murder. You'll hang. Don't you think they could have hanged me a dozen times already if they'd been so inclined? <laughs> Every case was proven and there was no defense. Oh, no, my dear. Don't pin your hopes upon any judge or lord of the land donning the black cap on my behalf. It would be like all the other times. Family pressures will be exerted in the right places at the right time. Everything will be hushed up very discreetly. Oh. And you? Where would you be? I? <laughs> Why, I should make another journey on the non-stop to Brighton. You do what? <laughs> Isn't it delightful? But true as well. I would be discreetly whisked back to the quiet sanatorium on the Reen Parade, where I would pass a prescribed period in considerable comfort and not in considerable boredom. Then, in due course, cured and penitent, I would come quietly home again, even as I'm doing now, to the welcoming arms of my saddened but eternally forgiving mother, to the thunderous silences of my gout-stricken father, and the sidelong glances of my slightly mystified and rather envious elder brothers. <laughs> but this is not the Dark Ages. These are modern times England, the year 1900. These things can't happen in enlightened times. Uh, don't depend upon it, my dear. If you have the right influence and enough money, and rest assured, we do have, you can make anything happen, can create any age to suit your tastes. And you say this has happened in... All your previous cases? In all of them. Tell me about them. What did you do? <laughs> Are you trying to play me for time, my dear? Is that it? I want to know. And I want to know why. <laughs> do you see the lights of Red Hill going by out there? Is that it? Despite your claim not to be expert upon the London to Brighton line, do you know that we are scant minutes now from Purley and Croydon? From Porter Heath, Clapham Junction, the river approaches. 
had a slowing run across the steel bridge into the great cavern of Victoria. Uh, is that it? Tell me about... I shall! Your incredible nerve and courage merit such small consideration. Tell me. Oh, not all of them. No, no, we really don't have time enough for that. I shall indeed tell you of the first, which for pure unsullied experience was by far the finest, and in view of my personal involvement, definitely the most satisfying. And I shall tell you of the last time, the only time I've ever failed. Do you realize, my dear, that night in the fog upon Clapham Common? If I had succeeded, it's a certainty that you would never have come to be in the position you are in this evening. Odd, isn't it? How fate actually does seem to play into one's hands. <laughs> Oops! What's that? Ah, yes, 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 I can see. The first of the long tunnels leading us into Coolston. We're under the North Downs already, my dear. A splendid train. I shall write a letter to the company, I think. It's most commendable. London in just a little while now. <laughs> we really don't have much time, do we? And I do want you to derive the maximum benefit from my little stories. If you're comfortable there in your corner, perhaps we can proceed. Hmm? Thank you, my dear. I was going to tell you of my first and finest, wasn't I? Sublime experience. One that you, for all your exquisite loveliness, will not be able to live up to. It was a pity. Mm. It happened when I was 17. Just two years after poor Burgess had gone off along his troubled way through the next world. It was on our estate. A little milkmaid. Sweet and pleasing. My first true love, I believe in the days of my innocence. But she showed a side of her nature that was both stupid and overly ambitious. It was then that I knew I would have to do away with her. And when she threatened me, well, well, you can understand, my dear. That was the end, wasn't it? Graham, I've got to talk to you. <laughs> Oh, Graham, stop it. Stop playing around and listen to me. What would you tell me, my dove? I... I don't know how to say it to you, to put it into words hmm? like. It's not easy and... It's not nice what you've done to me. Oh, come now, dearest. I'm here. You have my undivided and sympathetic attention. You needn't guard your words with me. You know that. So tell me, what is this awful thing that I've done to you? Oh, Graham, you are sweet to me. All right, I'll try. It's not easy, but I'll try. I know you'll understand. Of course I will. Now go on, girl. Oh, Graham. Yes, what is it? Well, there's no need to bark at me. I was just going to tell you. I'm going to have a baby. Your baby, Graham. I see. Well, if that's all you've got to say about it, just, I see. Then you sit there smiling and staring up in the sky. <laughs> I'm sorry, dearest. I was just thinking about this. It is momentous news, you know. Well, I... I don't want you just to think about it. I want you to tell me and tell me quick what you're planning on doing about it. That's precisely what I am doing. Planning. There didn't ought to be no need to think about it. It's plain and simple. Well, I haven't been going with no one else. Only you. I love you and, and you say you, you love me. Well, if that's true, there's only one right and proper thing to do as I see it. And what's that? You tell me. You got to marry me, that's what. Like you said before. And I shouldn't have to be the one to say it. You should ask me proper. That's it, Sally, darling. That's it. I was hoping you'd say that. Suggest it to me. It clarifies everything for me. It makes it all so wonderfully simple for me. Oh, you mean, it's all right. You do it like, 
Like you said. And not like I said, Sally. Let's rather put it this way. It will be done like I said. Oh, Graham, my dear. <laughs> I knew you'd do right by me. I knew you was a gentleman. You couldn't let me down, could you? No, darling. I couldn't possibly let you down. However, I need a little time to think this out. What do you mean you'll need time? It's already settled. We are getting married, you and me. Of course we are. Uh, but you, you, you must remember my family. Just because I'm a farm girl, I suppose I'm not good enough for old Lord and Lady Muckamuck up at the hall. Is that it? Although, seems to me, I'm good enough for their but, son. But you must understand, we'll have to be uh, uh, delicate about this. The news will shock the family, and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, that's just too bad for them. You should have thought about that before you done what you did. <laughs> it takes two, you know. Oh, Graham! Oh, calm down, dearest. If we're going to succeed at what we both want, we're going to have to be devious about it. That's why I'm asking you for time, until tonight at least, to devise a plan. Oh, well, all right. But just until tonight, mind. Then I want to know how we're going to go about it. Tonight, you'll know all about it. Usual time, usual place. I'll be there, Graham. Just slip out quietly. Don't let anyone know that you're going. We must be. Just like that, you killed that poor girl in cold blood. I suppose you could put it that way, yes. Or oh, rather, I prefer to think that Sally departed this life at its happiest moment. She was very happy when we met, you know. Why, well, I, I did it very quickly. She could hardly have suffered at all. What a cruel monster you are. You could be right. There's something to do with maladjustment, I suppose. It's possible I didn't howl the devil out of me hard enough on the day of my birth. And that girl came to you in all innocence. You killed her. Yes. When I got back to our rendezvous at nine o'clock, she was already waiting for me. Pleading a sick headache, I'd retired early. It was ridiculously easy to slip away from the house. I was certain I wouldn't be gone more than 15 minutes of the outside. Sally? Sally, are you there? Over here. Just inside the gate. Hang on, I'm coming. Oh, Graham, you're late. I was so worried, I, I thought something must have gone wrong. Nothing's ever going to go wrong for us again, Sally. Oh, Graham, my dear. Did you work out a plan for us? Yes. Yes, I did. Tell me. I'll do better than that, Sally. I'll show you. Oh, Graham, what you trying to do? Why, why are you holding me like that? Be still, can't you? Uh, no, Graham, no, no, it's hurting. You made a bad mistake, Sally. You signed your own death warrant when you threatened me. Mrs. X and Mrs. Y are the women in this case. Mrs. X, you are alleged to clean your sink and no more. Well, I... I Do you kill germs? I, I'm not sure. Is your sink hygienically clean? Well, maybe it is. I... Precisely. Mrs. Y, you use Vim 99? Yes, I do. You get your sink sparkling clean and kill 99% of household germs? That's correct. You see, only Vim 99 contains powerful germ-killing microbands. So Vim 99 gets your sink, pots and pans, bath and stove hygienically clean. 99% germ-free? Correct. Ladies of the jury, what is your verdict? By Vim 99. Look who's here. The girl in black. She never worries about dandruff. 
she uses Clinic, the anti-dandruff shampoo with the formula that gives between shampoo protection. She can wear black and comb her hair, and there's never a sign of dandruff. The girl in black uses Clinic. Give dandruff the Clinic treatment, and it's gone. <laughs> And you were never suspected? Even later? Apparently never. There was never a question asked me about the whole affair subsequently. What of your recent failure? Didn't you say something about Clapham Common? Oh, yes. Yes, that was a bad business. But I was overcome, you see. I was overcome upon the instant. Was it a woman? If you could call that kind of a creature a woman, yes. What kind? You know what kind. What kind of a woman would be upon the streets of Clapham in a fog at night alone? I saw her as I walked up beneath the street lamp. Hello, mister. Where are you going then, eh? I'm walking alone and content with the arrangement. You wouldn't feel like a bit of company then? I would not. You talk like a gent. But under the skin, you're all the same. I wouldn't wonder as you and me could have a nice time. Visit a few pubs. See some nice friends. It's cold out here. You shouldn't be walking around alone. Come on, be a bit matey and I'll keep you company. I've already told you that I prefer my own company. Yeah, company, hold on, what's yeah. this? The rich had actually linked arms with me and was attempting to walk along in my company. So you attacked her? I was berserk. To be accosted by such a creature was bad enough. But to, to have her odious company actually forced upon me, that was too much. I seized her by the throat, determined in that instant to put paid to her once and for all. Yeah. <laughs> what, you, uh, what are you up to? Let, let go of me throat. Let, you, let go. Let go. Ow. Oh, oh, please. Oh. I'll teach you to accost me. You'll never have the chance to further your aims again, I promise you. I'll kill you. Help me, somebody. Anybody, help. I'll get him back then. She fought me like a mad thing, and she was amazingly strong. Despite my best efforts, I was not able to prevail quickly as I had before. I'd almost decided to let the wretch live and make off hot foot when the matter was taken out of my hands completely. Help me! Oh, help me! Police! Murder! It, oh, it's Jack the Ripper! He's got me! I know it's him! Help! I released that awful creature and ran away into the fog. But my luck had deserted me. I blundered right into the arms of the police great heavy booted yokels who in their numbers soon quelled me. I was taken to Clapham police station, questioned and charged with assault with attempt to to cause, as the ponderous sergeant described it, grievous bodily harm. And what happened after that? I have declined firmly under all probing to give my name and address. And there were upon my person no papers to give me away. But during the night, lying sleepless in the police cell, a fit of mischief came upon me. I decided to reveal myself. Yes, no. What are you causing all this here fuss about, eh? I have reached a grave decision, Sergeant. Oh, oh, you have, have you? Well, now, that's interesting. And uh, what may it be? I have decided to reveal my identity to you. Uh, very kind of you, I'm sure. Just tell us what your name is so as I can write it down and you can stop giving us all this bother. Certainly, Sergeant. My name is Graham Felsham. Graham Felsham. All right, now we'll have a... Here. Here, wait a sec. Uh, you having me on, are you? Uh, you say you're Graham Felsham? <laughs> One and the same, Sergeant. At your service. Uh... And not that, Graham Felsham. Oh, you do me honor, Sergeant. But as you so succinctly put it, I am indeed that Graham Felsham. Mr. Ruth, this is getting a bit too much for me. Uh, here, 
Isn't there someone we can call in about this here? Oh, I'm sure there is. If you'll simply copy down this address and dispatch a handsome cab with a note that I shall write in the care of one of your constables, sound advice can be yours within the hour. I, of course, will be more than willing to bear the costs of these enterprises. To whom did you send the note? <laughs> to the address of one of the family solicitors in Temple Bar. And the results? <laughs> exactly as I could have foretold. Within 30 minutes, I was released into the care and custody of the solicitor and transported to his chambers. Everything was hushed up and the family name protected. And you went back to Brighton? Precisely. And there passed a restful and restorative six months. Hmm, rather strange coincidence, that. What are you talking about? Do you realize that as we wound up the story of my misadventure in Clapham, the train most appropriately tore through Clapham Junction Station. And this strengthens my resolve. What do you mean? It seems only fitting that I should achieve another outstanding success. Almost within shouting distance of the place where my one shameful failure occurred. In such a way, I can redeem myself. You can't really be serious. That you can kill me here when, when we're actually arriving at Victoria. But why not, my dear? It's most appropriate, isn't it? So close to Clapham. How well that solves my still wounded pride. And with the bridge coming up to us in the night. How easy it will be to throw your freshly dead body from the train window and into the black swirl of the river. <laughs> oh, come. You do see it my way, don't you? You must see it my way. What recourse do I have? I promise you. I promise you, you have my word of honor as a gentleman. It will not hurt you. No. No. You mustn't. You cannot. You feel virtually nothing, my dear. Just a slight pressure about your neck. Then it's, it's over. So quickly. Come on now. The train's slowing. There's no time left. Oh, let's do it. I beg you. Oh, can't you spare me? Let me live. Oh, let me step down from this train alive. But, Victoria, I'll go away from you at once. I'll forget everything that has passed between us tonight. I won't say a word. I promise you. I won't complain. But please, oh, please let me live. Don't kill me. I've done you no harm and I won't. Tempt me, you know. When I weigh this coolly, dispassionately, I find that I do not really want to kill you. But I'm driven on. Don't you see? And there's nothing, absolutely nothing, that I can do about this thing. And after all, how can I depend upon your words? Once your relief at being left alive is past, and you regain your balance, Anger and indignation must inevitably follow hard upon their heels. I gave you my word. I wouldn't break it. You're a gentleman, despite your, despite your sickness. You know the value of the given word. Oh, but that's what I beg you. I beg you, don't kill me. Oh, don't kill me. But it's time, you see. It is the time. And I have to know. I have to know about you. All about you, to the very last moment. The very last moment, you see. Only a few seconds more. You feel it. Feel it. The train, slowly, slowly, slowly beneath our feet. The grind of brakes against the steel wheels. And there, there, just ahead, the bridge, the city, the dark flow of the Thames. And beyond the great lit mouth of Victoria Station, just over on the other side. It's time, my dear. Our time together has run out. The closing seconds. And, oh, believe me. I'm so sorry. But it has to be done. It has to be done. Victoria, this 
Mrs. Victoria. All change, please. All change, dear. All change. Perhaps you'd better step down now, my dear. Mrs. Victoria. Can it stop? Yeah, but if the bright lights stop, and there are all those people. Inevitable as fate that it should stop. The line ends here. You, you let me live. You didn't kill me after all. You let me live. Oh, oh you couldn't do it, could you? you? You see, there is kindness in you after all. You're not as ill as you believe you are. You could be helped probably because you could do it that is so i couldn't do it oh thank you thank you and i, I made a promise to you you see I, i'll keep it i won't betray you to anyone not a soul it's a promise we'll see good evening your lordship nice to see you home again nice and safe you have a, a nice holiday sir good evening sure good to be back a passable time. Not at all bad, thanks. Uh, excuse me, miss, if you don't mind. I have to get by you. Uh, help his lordship. His lordship? That's right, miss. Help? How must you help? Shaw is my man, my dear. He has to carry me from this corner to my wheelchair out there on the platform. I'm a complete cripple, you see. You? You're a cripple? And I'm afraid so. Didn't you see the rug around my knees? But... And you couldn't... Attacked you? <laughs> <laughs> Never. Quite impossible. You could have pushed me away effortlessly with one of your small gloved hands. Then why did you plan to... What's this, miss? Is his lordship been having you on a bit then, eh? Having me on? Shaw knows me of old, my dear. I have something of a reputation as a practical joker. You look upon it as a joke, then, to subject a person to such a shocking experience as that I have undergone in your company. What did I say of anger and indignation following hard upon the heels of relief? Oh. You made me a promise, you know. Your silence in return for your life. This certainly puts a different complexion upon things. Would you please tell me your name? Why should I? Please. It's very important that I should know. Well, it's Billy. Miss Mary Billiard. And if I may ask further, your occupation, your profession. I'm an actress. Ah, oh, I should have known. It was so self-evident. Oh, really? The joke is on me, then. I don't see how Miss that... Miss here is my card. Please look at it while Shaw carries me to my wheelchair. Then, if you could join us for the short walk along the platform, I'd be most grateful. Here we are, then, your lordship. Uh, so Daisy. Oh, thank you. Hey, easy, does it? Excuse me, miss. Lord Felsham, author, poet, playwright. 11 Cavendish Muse, W1. If you're ready, Miss Billier. And will you please tell me? have to know what was the purpose of this cruel and pointless deception. Cruel? Yes. Pointless? I think not. In actual fact, we played out a trial on an idea I have for a new play. What? A play which I now intend to set upon paper, thanks to you and your most encouraging performance tonight, Miss Billier. A play? Yes. I roughed it out in my mind while I was at Brighton. I was planning to write it anyway. Your arrival in my compartment this evening touched off the idea of trying, trying out the plot of it to see if it would hold water. I must say, I'm quite satisfied. But, but this is unspeakable. Yes, it was rather naughty, wasn't it? <laughs> Something came over me. A sense of wicked mischief, you might say. You could almost call it a... Uh, a compulsion. Oh, please. Not that. Not again. Sorry, my dear. Tell me, are you employed right now? At the moment, no. Your being an actress is another of those delightful coincidences that add such sparkle to life. In view of my circumstances, I have to find that sparkle in bizarre ways. I wonder, would you be interested in the part? The part? When my play is written and goes into production, would you be interested in reading for the part of the young woman in the train? Just as we've done tonight. Precisely. I owe you something for what you've been through. As an actress, a leading part in one of my plays could further your career considerably. If you'll forgive my seeming boast. 
My reputation is extensive in the field. I'm aware of that. Now I know why. I don't think I could go through all that again. <laughs> Familiarity should, I'm sure, breed contempt. You do famously, you know. And you already know the part rather well. Uh, well... <laughs> Actually, it would be lovely. <laughs> Good girl. It's settled then. The part will be yours. You have my word on it. Please hold yourself in readiness. And keep my card so that you'll know where to get in touch with me. What will you call this play? It occurred to me a good title would be Non-Stop to Victoria. Very appropriate. Say you'll forgive me. There'll be no recurrence. Please. All right. You're forgiven. This one. Splendid. Well, we must leave you here, I'm afraid, but we'll be in touch with you. Is that an address? They have a forwarding address for me at the Empire Theatre. Good. You'll hear from me within a week. Good night, Miss Villiers. And thank you for a most diverting journey. Good night.